We closed last week discussing the westernizers and the Slavophiles, and we discussed the origins of what is referred to as the Russian intelligentsia. That oppositional movement comprised largely of educated elites who have found themselves to be alienated both from the autocracy and from Russian society generally because they possess Western education, they possess a desire to make good on the values and the ideals that they have learned from the West at the insistence of the state. But they lack the ability and they lack the political rights that their compatriots would have in the West, Western nobles, educated Englishmen, educated Frenchmen. And we're beginning to see a process now in the 1830s and the 1840s influenced by the, the, uh, the Industrial Revolution, the French Revolution, this new resurgent Russian nationalism, or I shouldn't say new resurgent, but this new Russian nationalism that is surging to the fore under the influence of German Romanticism, which is sort of coloring this idea of what it means to be a nation. We talked quite a bit about the Narod, the Volk, or Das Volk in German, but Narod in Russian, this idea of the collective people and what the members of the intelligentsia come to believe. Whether they are westernizers, and I talked briefly about the Serion Badinsky, whether they are Slavophiles like Kiryevsky or Khomyakov, both of those groups feel a real obligation to, provide, to sacrifice and to work toward the liberation and the emancipation of the peasants so that they are no longer serfs, but they are free farmers after the standpoint to say, you know, American farmers or, or British peasants, British freeholders, French peasants, and things along those lines after the French Revolution. But the Russians are reacting at a time when things in Europe are bubbling to the fore. You had the, the tumult of the French Revolution, uh, the overthrow of Louis XVI, cutting off his head, Napoleon's rise, the restoration of the monarchy. We'll talk about that in a second. And the Russians are trying to make heads and tails out of all this, while at the same time, while at the same time, trying to identify for themselves what it means to be Russian at this particular point. And one of the one of the arguments that I made last week was that the Russians find themselves in a unique position. Both the Slavophiles and the Westernizers are emerging out of that German Romanticism, and they look to the West and they see those factories. They see the political parties, they see the tumult in the streets, and they're thinking to themselves, aha, this is our potential future. Industry is coming. Can we avoid it? If we can't avoid it, or is there something, something that we can do to ameliorate or to make the suffering less? They're looking for Western models still, and they're measuring themselves against the West, while at the same time, thanks to this new Russian nationalism, they're thinking now, wait a second, we don't just have to ape the West. We can borrow things here and there, but we can do it better. Russia can lead the way to a future that is every bit as technologically advanced, every bit as modern, but perhaps less exploitive of the working class. Without the degradation of the urban slums, without the, uh, the, the child labor in the factories, we can find our own path. This goes all the way back to stuff we talked about at the very beginning of the semester. Palmer's six rules for understanding Russian history, this idea that Russia has, somehow has a historical mission that makes it special. This is where it's really going to begin coming to the fore. We will come back, and I'm going to talk a little bit tonight, late, 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 if we have the time, about the second generation of Westernizers. But this idea of the intelligentsia now is going to be a thread throughout the rest of the semester. Because it's from the ranks of this radical intelligentsia that the origins of the Russian revolutionary movement are going to emerge. We're going to step back for just a second. I need to pick up some foreign relations information, international relations, on in the aftermath of the defeat of Napoleon for the second time in 1815. In the aftermath of, I should say, after Napoleon's first defeat, and then he's going to come back and he's going to be defeated again, something is underway in Western Europe known as the Congress of Vienna. It's a, it's a convocation, a meeting of chancellors, foreign ministers, and leading heads of state who've been called together to settle the continent's boundaries in the aftermath of almost a generation of war brought about by the French Revolution and Napoleon's rise. The principal goal of the Congress of Vienna was to assure stability on the continent, to bring about a, relative, a peace that is lasting after many, many years of upheaval. What the Congress decides to do is after all of the years of the French Revolution, the Congress members restore the French monarchy 
and they also restored traditional rulers to places like Spain and Italy. And they rearranged territory in the center of the continent, forming something that comes to be known as the German Confederation. The German Confederation, German-speaking states, some of which are going to fall within the uh, spheres of influence of larger states like Austria, Hungary, the Kingdom of Prussia. The idea here is to try and find a balance of power, a balance of power between the leading heads of Europe, uh, Russia, the Austrian Empire, Great Britain, and a restored France that will ensure that the revolutionary tumult that had been launched in 1789 that had continued into the 18-teens would finally uh, be brought under control. The result, in many respects, is successful. The individual who is the figure that is behind most of this, the leading, uh, the leading light and the, idea, the fellow whose idea it is to create this balance of power, is the Austrian uh, uh, foreign minister, a fellow by the name of Clemens von Metternich. Metternich. It's not a name I'm going to ask you guys to remember for the exam or anything like that. If you've had Western civilization, if you've had 19th century European history, you know Metternich is considered to be the leading statesman of the first quarter, the first half of the 19th century. He is the guiding mind, the guiding principle behind achieving this balance of power. It's going to last. <coughs> there will not be another large major conflict in Europe, a, a European-wide conflict, until World War, I. World War I, 1914. So this balance of power is going to last almost 100 years. There will be a couple of flare-ups here and there. Uh, Germany is going to rise. We'll talk about that later in the semester. They're going to beat the Austrians. They're going to beat the, the French, because everybody beats the French in the late 19th century. Uh, but this balance of power is going to be attained. It's not simply dealing with the results of the Napoleonic Wars, however. The ideas unleashed by the French Revolution proved to be more difficult to quell than Napoleon was. And the backdrop against this, of course, we also see the unleashing of the Industrial Revolution. In the aftermath of this, I, I mentioned last week the idea that the Russians are inspired, the Germans are inspired, the Italians are inspired by the arrival of the Napoleonic Codes, the values and the ideals of the French Revolution that Napoleon uses in order uh, to provide some degree uh, of political stability within the lands as he's controlling them in 1810, 1811, 1812. Napoleon emerges as something of a model for a restless generation of young men who are going to come of age in these first decades of the 19th century. Although Prussians and Italians and Russians like our Decembrists are going to adhere to nationalist ideas, they see Napoleon's example as this great man who has come striding across history to, wrap it, to overturn and change the continent's makeup. They see him as a romantic model, a larger-than-life figure. And Napoleon's example leaves an entire generation of young men with a thirst for heroism <coughs> and adventure. And inspired by those emerging romantic ideas, the role that the individual can play in transforming history, the value of individual subjectivity, <coughs> this young generation, represented in Russia by the Decembrists, are also, are, it, it's also going to affect uh, young men elsewhere on the continent. And between the 19-teens through the 1930s, we are going to, we're going to see the outbreak of a number of revolutionary moments. Revolutionary moments shown here on the map. Here's, here are Decembers, for example, in 1825. But if you look here in the Italian states, Barcelona, 1820, Valencia, 1820, um, uh, Pamplona, 1820, there's a riot in Manchester in 1812. This is some of the, the, the tumult and the unrest that emerges in the aftermath of the Congress of Europe, inspired here by a desire, if not to, not to restore Napoleon, right, but to embrace the ideals of the French Revolution as at least they regard the overturning of that old society of orders, the removal of aristocratic privilege, and the beginning of a movement toward the establishment of individual rights. So these are what we might call almost constitutional revolutions. Folks are trying to bring about nationalist constitutional uh, uh, orders in, in these lands that otherwise have been governed and ruled 
by absolutist uh, kings. Uh, it, nationalism then becomes an important element, not just in the Russian lands, in the German-speaking lands, in the Italian lands, these revolutionaries aspire for national sovereignty. The Italians want to unite all of the Italian speakers on the Italian peninsula. Recall, we talked last week that for the Romantics, language, shared language, shared culture, shared religion, shared tradition, these are some of the defining elements of what constitutes a people. This idea attracts Russians, it also attracts Italians, it attracts obviously uh, German-speaking peoples as well. This period of, na of rising nationalism and the outbreak of uh, aspirations for the establishment of free and independent states in 1830 is going to lead in France to yet another revolution. In 1830, Charles X, part of that monarchical order that is restored by the Congress of Vienna, Charles X is going to infuriate liberal public opinion in France by enacting a series of repressive and very conservative laws. He enacts strict censorship, he creates new laws on sacrilege, he's an ardent Catholic, and it appears as if what he wants to do is to restore the absolutist system after the fashion of a Louis XIV. In response to Charles' repressive policies, his arch-reactionary policies, protesters take to the streets, street fighting erupts <coughs> in late July of 1830, and in order to forestall the radicalization of the revolution leading to the creation of another republic, which is what had happened in France between 1789 and 1794, culminating in the Great Terror and the murder of around 25 to 30,000 people. What liberal ministers within the French educated classes are going to do is they are going to come to an agreement to create something that comes to be known as the July Monarchy. They agree to form a constitutional monarchy under the reign of a fellow by the name of Louis Philippe. He's the Grand Duke of Orleans and a cousin of Charles X. The July Monarchy of 1830 comes to represent the ascendancy of political liberalism, the political liberalism in France. I will talk about and define political liberalism for you in just a few minutes. But I want to leave that there hanging for a minute the French example, and this is Eugene Delacroix's Liberty Leading the People, and it, it's, it's, it's the archetypal image of the July monarchy in this quest to establish, sort of blending together here uh, the aspirations of the French people, the tricolor flag of the revolution behind this allegorical figure of Lady Liberty. We've seen this, if you're an American, you know something about Lady Liberty. Leading the people onward, trampling down the, old, the, the, the ascendant old regime in the form of Charles X and establishing a constitutional monarchy that proves the longer it goes on to be extraordinarily corrupt. So liberalism is going to demonstrate an inability to rule in France and they're going to fall out of favor by the mid-1840s. We'll get to that. Now against this broad backdrop of resurgent nationalism and this desire for liberal constitutional uh, regimes, there are other social tensions at play. We've got national tensions on one level, but also social tensions as well. Because the period between the Congress of Vienna in 1815 and the mid-century point around 1848 coincides as well with the beginning in earnest of industrialization on the continent. And what we see taking place in France and the German lands are things that we've already discussed about evolving in Britain under that British model at the turn of the 19th century. Mass migration from countryside to city, rapid urbanization, the emergence of large factories, all of the attendant rising social tensions between factory workers and factory owners, and needless to say, the uncontrolled and unrestricted growth of urban centers, leading to overcrowding, growing anxiety, misery, immiseration of the urban inhabitants, as urban governments on the continent are overwhelmed by this influx of individuals into the towns, infrastructure is going to be overtaxed. Many of those cities, Paris for example, it's an old medieval city, very narrow crooked lanes, it's not well suited to this huge influx of humanity that arrives. 
Workers end up facing severe overcrowding. It worsens the already dire sanitary traditions, uh, uh, sanitary conditions. 1820s in Europe, 1830s in Europe, generally speaking, not a pleasant place to walk the urban streets. You know, peop some people are still dumping their chamber pots out of the window in the morning. You know, everybody know what a chamber pot is? Okay, it's what you relieve yourself in at night so you don't have to get up and go outside to the loo. Garbage and refuse littered the unpaved streets, uh, especially of the poor districts. There's smoke, there's f uh, smog, putrid smells, absence of factory, regulation, uh, factory regulations. This is the very worst moment, right, of the Industrial Revolution, calling to, horror, calling to mind all the horrors of the, uh, the factory, all the horrors of the overcrowded industrial setting. Water in most places was scarce. I mean, the drinking water was scarce. It'd be fetched daily from nearby fountains. Private companies in London owned the water supply, and they would turn it on and turn it off maybe only for a couple of hours uh, during the course of, uh, of the day. So you had to queue up just to get fresh water. You, most folks didn't have running water. Sewage removal was practically non-existent. Like I said, residents would simply dump refuge into the streets or courtyard. Human excrement collected in cesspools under apartment houses. It was a really atrocious way to live. In London, in London by the 1830s, there was somewhere on the order of 250,000 cesspools. They were emptied on average twice a year. Horses, too, added to the filth. The main form of transportation in the city for hauling large loads, horses. In 1900, St. Petersburg, Russia, alone, had approximately half a million horses in the city itself, hauling, you know, hauling goods and services, transporting people, and, of course, leaving messes behind them as they walked. It's not surprising that given this terribly unsanitary uh, circumstance that diseases and epidemics were rampant. One of the worst killers of the 19th century was cholera. A cholera epidemic would strike Paris in 1832, killing 18,000 people. Another one in 1849, 17 years later, killed 20,000. Now both of these two cholera epidemics also reached London and in each instance killed about 7,000 people. But cholera was not something that was isolated to the well-developed and industrialized West. Cholera would, temper, would, would, from time to time, sweep through Russia as well. That 1832 epidemic in Paris that killed 18,000, that same year, 20,000 Russians are killed when cholera sweeps through the Western portions of the empire. Between 1847 and 1851, Four years of recurrent cholera outbreaks in the Russian Empire will claim as many as a million lives. Now, you think about that today when we talk about you know, this, this and that kind of an epidemic. Yes, sir, Mr. Ryan. One million between 1847 and 1851. Cholera was the disease that everybody feared, and they feared it because it was such a visible and visceral thing to experience. This is actually a 1911 illustration from the journal. Cholera was the one that people feared because when it, when it broke out, large numbers of people um, caught it at once. But it wasn't the worst killer of the 19th century. The worst killer was tuberculosis or consumption okay, that affects the, little, the, the lining and the endings of the lungs and it causes those blood vessels to burst until the lungs fill up with blood. And you end up you know, bleeding internally, coughing and suffocating to death. Tuberculosis was widespread in 19th century Europe, but it didn't strike in an epidemic fashion. Cholera would come sweeping in, and then it would disappear for a few years, and then it would come roaring back. Tuberculosis killed individuals constantly during the 19th century. It's in the wake of images of widespread uh, epidemic, in the wake of the horrible living conditions that increasing numbers of urban workers are going to come to have to deal with these day-to-day -day realities that the two major ideologies of the 19th century, of the mid-19th century, emerge. And they come to dominate political discourse in the West. The first of these, and we have nationalism, of course, is, is a form of ideology. But nationalism is peculiar insofar as that most anybody can be a nationalist. You can be a nationalist on the left of the political spectrum. You can love your country and be a left-winger. You can love your country and be a right-winger. 
that make sense to everybody? So nationalism is a constant, at least for the time being. But there are political approaches, ideals and ideologies that emerge in response or along with the rise of the Industrial Revolution. The first of these is something that we refer to as liberalism. Do not think liberal 20, you know, 2015 the United States. This is not 21st century American liberalism. This is what we would refer to, some would refer to as classical liberalism of the, uh, the late 18th and the early 19th century. In the American tradition, liberalism, and actually in the European tradition as well, liberalism of this sort is, is, is traced to the writings of an Enlightenment thinker by the name of John Locke. John Locke. And other Enlightenment uh, writers who define themselves in opposition to conservatives on their right and to revolutionaries on their left. Generally speaking, a 19th century liberal, whether it is an American, one of the founding fathers, or someone who was tied to the founding fathers, whether it's a Frenchman, whether it's a, Brit, uh, a member of the, of the British political order, supports, a liberal supports constitutional guarantees. Guarantees of personal liberty, guarantees of economic free trade. What the liberal aspires to do is to maximize individual liberty, hence the name of the ideology, liberalism. Every ideology is going to place one or two values at the absolute forefront of all that it holds dear. And for the 19th century liberal, the paramount value is maximizing individual liberty by restricting the coercive power of the state and by creating as broad an area for individual activity as is possible. How do you restrict the coercive power of the state? You do that through constitutional guarantees. Things like the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen in the French context, things like the Bill of Rights in the American context. The 18th century liberal would say, in general, the best government is the government that governs the least. The government that interferes as little as possible in the lives of its citizens, that is optimal. Now, what constitutes a specific national brand of liberalism depends, depends. In Italy, liberals tended to ally themselves with movements for national liberation. In Britain and France, liberals agitated for reform. Reform, especially in Britain where you have a parliament, you already have a representative type of government. They tend to be represented in Britain more by the middle class. In Italy, in, the, in, uh, in Austria-Hungary, the lands, or I should say in Austria, we don't have Austria-Hungary just left. In the lands of the Austrian Empire, liberals actually tend to gravitate towards some members of the gentry. So you have gentry liberals. These are not Fa these are not uh, uh, workshop owners, these are not factory owners, they're landed members of the gentry, many of them are nationalists, but what they want to do is they want to secure rights, or <clears throat> more accurately, they want to trade their, their, their noble privileges, they want to transform those noble privileges granted by the state into the rights of citizens that citizens have entered into a compact with in the form of a constitutional monarchy with the, uh, with the king or with the queen. Does that make sense? So liberalism is going to come in, 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 a, in a number of different varieties, but, but at the very bottom, at, at the very base, they want to protect individual liberty, they want to expand personal rights, and they want to secure those rights through constitutions. What liberals fear are Republicans. Republicans, and again, Please don't think Republicans in the standpoint of you know, the 21st century American Republicans. We mean Republicans like the Jacobins in France in 1793-1794 who, who, who abolish the constitutional monarchy and create the Republic as a way of trying not only to secure the rights of citizens but also to bring about a degree of social leveling. So it's what we would call today this, this concept of social justice. The Republicans are going to be a little bit more to the left of your liberals, 
and the Republicans are oftentimes going to embrace the masses. Mass participation in politics is what the Republican is going to hold dear. The liberal is oftentimes going to fear that because how did that work out in France? <laughs> 1794, 1795, blood literally flowed in the streets. The liberals are not entirely thrilled with the uneducated and the unpropertied. And in one of the things that, that the liberal advocates, like Alexis de Tocqueville, a Frenchman who is very closely associated with the July monarchy and who writes arguably the best book ever <coughs> on the United States and its political system. Tocqueville is going to be one of those who, along with other liberals, want to do things like impose <coughs> property qualifications on voting. The idea of one person, one vote is not something a 19th century liberal is going to embrace. They want qualified voting so that you have to meet certain thresholds for paying taxes or owning property before you get a vote. Otherwise, if you don't rise to that threshold, you will have a system of electors so that you know, the, the lower classes will gather together and all of you peons will vote a single elector to represent your interests, while I, the, the well-to-do you know, quasi-noble or middle-class taxpayer with lots of property, I get to vote directly. So the liberal, to the left of the liberal, is uh, the uh, Republican. To the left of the Republican is something altogether new. The liberals would be associated in time with a group that comes to be known as the bourgeoisie. Property owners. For our intended, for, 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 for our purposes tonight, the bourgeoisie is effectively synonymous with the middling classes. Middling classes. It's going to come to be a loaded term very, very quickly. The other major ideology that's going to emerge in mid-century, unlike liberalism, which is emerging along with the rising capital system, the other major ideology of the 19th century emerges in opposition to industry. It emerges in opposition to the excesses of the Industrial Revolution. This is an ideology that is known as socialism. Socialism and liberalism are, in the course of the 19th century, in tension. Socialism is the more recent of the European ideologies, and it is a little bit more difficult to define, in part because socialism is a term fraught with ambiguity and a multiplicity of meanings. At its core, socialism is a negation. It's an oppositional faith. It emerges in opposition to an existing economic system, an existing social system, that we identify as either capitalism or some kind of a free market-based uh, economy. Where the liberal who embraces capitalism supports individualism, believes fervently in market competition, market competition is what is going to, is going to drive innovation drive down in time the cost of products and open up more new products for wider and wider groups of people to purchase. It's what Adam Smith, the great uh, political economist, the great Scottish Enlightenment political economist in Wealth of Nations says. A, the, uh, we equate this with the idea that the sum of private <coughs> vices equals public good. Driven by my greed to make more, as the business owner, I, I unintentionally create social good. I construct a factory, and I need someone to run that factory, so I bring in workers. Those workers now have jobs and pay, and they produce things that they can buy and that other people can buy. And my factory generates revenues, and my revenues are taxed by the state. And I innovate. Was this my intention? Is this what drives me as social good? Hell no, I just want to be rich. But these things come out as a result. This competition, this desire for greed, the liberal would ultimately say is a good thing. But markets are uncertain. Market goes up, the market goes down. I can make a bajillion dollars. I can lose everything and go bankrupt. And of course, during, during the 19th century, both in Europe and the United States, if you've studied American history, you've heard of those boom and bust cycles. 
everything is great, then the market falls, and everything is bad, that everything is great, then the market falls, and everything is bad. These contradictions, the greed, the competition, the boom and bust cycles, obviously the immiseration of the factory workers, it is, it is these living, existing, experienced aspects of this economic and social system that the socialists are reacting against. And what they posit, they don't create anything. They posit instead an alternative. In opposition to the individualism of liberalism, the socialist is going to advocate collective action or collective good. As opposed to competition, the socialist wants cooperation. Rather than having individuals motivated by greed, the socialist believes he or she is motivated by altruism, a desire to do better for other people. The uncertainty of the market, the boom and the bust cycle, the socialist believes in time that can all be leveled out. How do you level out the boom and the bust? Well, rather than allowing the chaotic market to just do whatever it does, the state or some state element should intervene to regulate production so that you have some degree of planning in place that can make this apparently chaotic boom and bust cycle of the market more rational, more rational. Where the, the liberal measures equality in legal terms, equality under the law, the socialist measures equality in economic terms. Does he have more than me? Socialism is above all a desire for transcendence, an escape from the present miseries of the here and now, and it posits the possibility of creating an ideal other world. It is, at its heart, a utopian ideology. Whereas you can point with capitalism to factories, <coughs> distribution of labor, specialization of labor, and that sort of thing, and you can say, here the production is underway. The socialist says we need to take that production and transform it organizationally into something different that's more fair, more economically just, that, that is more even in its development, that, under, that uh, undoes some of the inefficiencies, the alleged inefficiencies of the market. These then are the two ideologies that are going to emerge by mid-century, and it's these ideologies above all that our Russian westernizers and Slavophiles are trying to grapple with. Remember, Peter the Great, in his model, he's looking in the 18th century, he's looking to French absolutism. He's got a single system to embrace. Our Russians in the 1830s and the 1840s, well, you can embrace nationalism, you can embrace republicanism, you can embrace in liberalism, you can embrace socialism. Maybe there's some other form out there that you can create on your own, but all of a sudden you have a multitude of potential models that are emerging in the West. Which is the right one? Which is the right one for Russia? If none of them are right, maybe the Russian model is some combination of those. Well, we don't know yet. That's what makes this period in Russian history so fascinating because we're, we're witnessing with our Slavophiles and with our Westernizers the Russians trying to come to terms with forces that haven't quite yet arrived in Russia. Industrialization, we, this isn't Moscow or St. Petersburg in the 1830s and the 1840s. Moscow and St. Petersburg in the 1830s and 1840s honestly looks pretty much a lot like they did in the 18, in 1800 or in the 1790s. You don't have large-scale factory production. You don't have the, the proletarianization or the, you know, the, the taking of the serfs, because well, we still have serfs. We don't have you know, free farmers who've been kicked off their land because of enclosure laws and they have to go into the cities. Russia in the 1830s, 1840s looks a lot like Russia in the 1790s, but Europe is rapidly being transformed by the Industrial Revolution, by the French Revolution. How, then, are all of these things going to affect the empire? of the czars. Added to this on a larger European-wide level is that the forces of nationalism and socialism, republicanism and liberalism are going to come to clash in the year 1848. The revolutionary year at mid-century when revolution once again breaks out in Paris as it had done in 1830 as it had done in 1789, 
and inspires a rolling wave of revolution that sweeps the continent, especially in the, in the German-speaking lands, but affects as well the Italian states, affects the Austrian Empire, and we see the outbreak of revolt even in the western regions of the Russian Empire. And here, we see our combination of liberalism and nationalism. Warsaw is the capital of? Poland. Poland. Our Poles are going to rise up, and they want, no, they want a number of things. They want a constitution, because the Kingdom of Poland is a constituent element now of the Russian Empire. They want a constitution. They want greater degrees of sovereignty, but they also want independence. They want an independent Poland. How do you think Nicholas I is going to react to this? The autocrat whose who's, who's slogan, autocracy, orthodoxy, and or, orthodoxy, autocracy, and nationality, we're not going to put up with this. Jump in and crush the Poles. There are Poles, of course, as well in the Austrian Empire. They, too, are going to revolt. Uh, and in 1847, uh, 1848, what comes to be known as the Galician Slaughter, Polish peasants in the Austrian Empire are going to fall upon Polish gentry. And it's going to be something not exactly as widespread as, as Pugachev under Catherine, but you're going to see this mass peasant uprising among the Polish peasants, and they will uh, uh, attack the, uh, the, the gentry, and that's the, the painting here from Levitsky. 1848 is going to rile the entire continent, and it's going to, it's, it's going to shake to the foundation uh, France, Russia not so much. The German Confederate Prussia the, the leading German state, let me go back to my map here of, of Europe in, all the way back here. Prussia, the leading German state, or one of the leading German states, because the Austrians are also present, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the Prussian king is going to uh, confront a gathering of German nationals in something known as the Frankfurt Parliament. When liberal, leaning, educated Germans are going to come together from all of the German-speaking lands, this confet this this, this odd German confederation. What is it they want? They want a single united Germany, just like there's a single united France. This is a first abortive effort to try and create a united Germany. What the Frankfurt uh, Parliament or the Frankfurt Assembly offers to the King of Prussia is a constitution. But the King of Prussia is sovereign. He's an old style, you know, mostly absolutist ruler. He rules based upon his own authority. If he accepts the Constitution from the Frankfurt Assembly, he's accepting that the representatives of the Frankfurt Parliament are going to have some say in the way in which this newly constituted German state would run. He's not interested, thanks. And the Frankfurt Assembly is going to be broken up. The aspirations of the German liberal nationalists are going to fall by the wayside. And what ends up happening after a tumultuous 16 months or so between 1848 and 1889, or 1848 and 1849, is this wave of revolutionary tumult is going to run its course, and these revolutions are in time going to peter out as you have interventions brought in. The Prussians are going to intervene um, in some of these lands. The, the Crown will send in troops to quash the revolutionaries. Nicholas I will crush the Polish uprising. He'll order Russian soldiers in to crush the Poles. He also acquiesces to a request from the Austrian crown to send Russians into Austria to crush the uprising of 1848 there as well. And in the process, Nicholas I solidifies his reputation as something known as the gendarme of Europe. It's Nicholas I who has imposed order after 1848, saving the Austrian crown, aiding the Prussian crown, maintaining that stability, maintaining that sense of legitimacy that had been born of the Congress of Vienna in 1815. And it is exactly these forces, liberalism, socialism, republicanism, that Nicholas I wants to keep out of Russia. This is why he embraces that idea of orthodoxy, autocracy, and nationality. None of that European stuff. Maintain an absolute state under the command of the autocrat whose power is going to remain unfettered, unlimited by constitutions, unlimited by parliamentary assemblies. 
you know, by the, the middle of the, of the 19th century, by 1848, by 1849, Russia enjoyed a certain primacy of place among all of the leading European states, spanning Eurasia from the Polish lands in the west to the Pacific shores in the east and beyond to Alaska in North America. The empire was the product of one of the most stunning and successful campaigns of territorial expansion in human history. Between the reign of uh, Ivan IV, when he ascended the throne, and Peter's return from his European embassy, the Tsarist realm added, on average, lands equal in size to the Netherlands today each and every year. The country is expanding rapidly for a, for a century and a half. Rush, the Russian Empire adds lands equal in size to the Netherlands <coughs> each year. This territorial growth is going to slow during the 18th century, but as the 19th century dawned, the empire, the Russian Empire, was, of course, the world's largest contiguous state. This filled European leaders with anxiety and dread. By the 1830s and the 1840s, memories of those, uh, memories of those Russian uh, peasants who had swept across Europe in 1814-1815 very much were in the minds of European leaders. Here, Nicholas I had come in to impose order. We see the heads of state sweeping up uh, the, the remnants of 1848. But Russia's suppression of, of, of the Poles, its intervention in 1848 on behalf of Prussia and Austria, that heightened anxiety over the gendarme of Europe. Russia's realm seemed to be different from the West. And the Russian Empire increasingly appeared to be a malevolent force in the East. And we begin seeing cartoons like this one from uh, the British Punch magazine in the early 1850s, early 1850s, depicting Russia as what? A bear. But a bear behind this <laughs> fortress with this cannon in the East. Here are the oppressed Poles. Here are the Russian uh, soldiers stabbing and lashing. And here is the Russian bear looking over. The, this is simply too small to read. Sorry, guys. But this is the idea here, this idea that Russia is, is somehow a part of Europe, that it was a danger, that it was backward, that it was um, a, a repressive force. Russia's interventions in East Central Europe in the 1830s and 40s were driven by Nicholas's desire for order and stability. He, he, the Russians don't add any lands in the West under Nicholas's reign. It's the first time since the reign of Peter the Great when Russia has, does not add lands by acquiring new Western territories. They acquire stuff in Central Asia. The empire is continuing to expand, but it's not expanding toward the West. From the Tsar's vantage point in St. Petersburg, Russia's great size, its impossibly diverse populations, its expansive and amorphous borders were sources of weakness, not strength. And I talked about this very early in the semester. It depends upon your perspective. If you're the Ukrainians today looking to the east, oh my god, well, I mean, you got Russians occupying portions of your, of your territory. If you're the Poles, the Lithuanians, the Latvians, you're looking to the east and you see this gigantic country. And you're concerned, and perhaps rightfully so, because there's a very aggressive uh, leader uh, in, uh, in the Kremlin. If you're Putin, the argument could be, well, here you've got this very large amorphous territory, and you're surrounded on all sides by either enemies or potential enemies. The Baltic states, they hate the Russians. The Poles, they hate the Russians. The Ukrainians hate the Russians. You've got all this instability in and around Turkey and the Middle East. That's not far from the Russian border. And you have, of course, in the Caucasus, you have Islamic fundamentalists in Chechnya and elsewhere who have waged terrorist attacks. What is ISIS going to do? Well, it wants to feed terrorist attacks into southern Russia. So the justification would be you've got to go in and do something. You've got the Chinese. Oh, my Lord, the Chinese are the world's most populous country, vastly more wealthy than the Russians. In the spurt of a gigantic movement to, 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 to modernize, everywhere you look, there's insecurity. This would be the same. This is the way Nicholas I viewed things in the 1830s and the 1840s. He believed that by combining the forces 
of bayonets and internal police forcing, uh, po internal police forces, he could prevent subversion in his realm. <coughs> but it comes at a growing cost. I talked a little bit last week about the imposition of censorship. We talked a little bit about Nicholas I and the ways in which the autocracy under Nicholas I was, in, was important in advancing two particular fields, technical education and the periodical press. These would lay the foundation later for the growth of Russian industry. But during Nicholas's reign, despite these efforts to bring in steamships, to bring in railroads, the Russian economy, Russia's economic strength, and as a result, the Russian military is weakened. It's weakened because Russia does not yet industrialize. That industrialization spurt is going to come much, much later in the 1880s and 1890s. Russian industrialization is going to be retarded, and its technology, specifically its military technology, is going to prove to not be up to the task of facing off against now industrialized or industrializing Western nations. These are all the problems that Russia is facing mid-century. But all appears to be well. 1848 after all, those revolutions are crushed. Revolutions put down in Hungary in 1849. Russian soldiers are the ones that, that do it. Nicholas could take a bit of solace in the fact that he had played a role in restoring stability and order. And what is it the, autoc the autocracy wants in Russia? Stability and order. Stabilnost poriadok in Russian. Stability and order. If we step back and take, however, a look at the lives of the ordinary Russian peasant recruits in the army, what we discover is that amidst all this tumultuous change going on in, in France and in England and the German-speaking lands, <coughs> from the standpoint of, of, of Russian military technology, the 50 years between 1800 and 1850, not much different. A lot's happened. Napoleon has been defeated. Russia has reigned triumphant. There's been a Decemberist uprising. Alexander I has passed. Nicholas I has come on the scene. We have industrial revolution on the continent. All of these tumultuous activities. What's going on in Russia? Well, the experience of a young peasant conscript drafted into the army, say, in 1850, was hardly any different than the experience of a peasant conscript drafted into the army two or even three generations earlier. The draftee had been chosen for his induction probably because in the village he came from he had a reputation as being a drunkard, a troublemaker, or a layabout. These are the kinds of people you didn't want in the village, so these are the ones who were chosen as often as not to go into the army. You can imagine the quality of those average Russian soldiers. The recruit upon induction was uprooted from all he had ever known He's given over to a tyrannical and generally corrupt military bureaucracy. All of his ties with his previous life are going to be severed. And upon exiting his native village, the recruit surrendered any residual claims to communal property. He can't come back to his village and resettle there after his service. It was economically untenable. In the absence of any real military leave, a return home at any point in your life was, was probably not going to happen. It's for that reason that when a, a young peasant recruit left his family to join the army, a funeral service was held. Lamentations and wailing and all of the sort of thing that would accompany a funeral, this accompanied the departure of a recruit. Now, the good news is that you enter into the army, you're no longer a serf. You're freed from the bonds of serfdom, but once enjoined into the ranks, you're there for at least 25 years. That's basically a lifetime sentence. This is better because under Peter the Great, it was a lifetime sentence. And in time, we're going to find out the service tenure is going to decrease. But military service remains in 1850 fraught with difficulty and peril. Obviously, you can be killed or wounded in wartime. Yes, sir? Just out of curiosity, let's say the, or the person leaving happens to survive those 25 years. He can't go home after he's... 
commission, where does he go? He resettles somewhere. Okay, just Oftentimes to Siberia, sometimes to uh, Ukraine, become Cossacks or freebooters. Okay. Yeah. Although odds are really good after 25 years in the Russian army, there's not much of you left. Fair. You know, if you're going off as a 20-year-old, you're getting out as a 45-year-old, you know, trust me. You start to feel like you're beginning to break down in your mid to late 40s. Imagine after 25 years in the Russian army. Obviously, you can be killed, you can be wounded in combat. But there are also constant threats of sickness and disease, and that's actually going to claim more lives. Death rates in the Russian army were extraordinarily high, nearly double that experienced by soldiers in contemporary European armies. The soldier's death rate was more than three times that of Russian civilians within a comparable age cohort. Does that make sense to everybody? If you're a 25-year-old in the Russian army in 1850, you are three times more likely to die in a given year than a 25-year-old anywhere else not in the army. That's what I mean by that. Now, state efforts to educate soldiers meant that as the 19th century progressed, literacy rates, although they're still very, very low, do improve. But this, is hardly off, this hardly offsets the sufferings and sacrifice imposed on Russian recruits. By 1850, military expenditures account for somewhere between 50 and 60 percent of the entire state budget. Think about that for a second. 50 to 60 percent of the entire Russian budget is going to support the army. But here's the thing, because the army is so large, and it's so large because the country is so big, those borders are so, so amorphous, all that money, 90% of that money, goes to cover food and clothing. Weapons, powder, shot, other battlefield necessities, those are constantly in short supply in the Russian army by 1850. Rations are meager, pay is low. Regiments are compelled to seek a degree of self-sufficiency. I talked about the artels last week. That's why. They're, they're not being fed enough. They're not being properly clothed. In some cases, they're having to sew their own cloaks. Continuity in soldiers' daily experience, because the soldiers in 1850 are experiencing almost the same way of life that soldiers experienced in 1800 during the Napoleonic campaigns. Continuity with that daily experience was matched, believe it or not, by a continuity in weaponry. By the middle of the 19th century, Imperial Russia had attained something close to self-sufficiency in the production of military armaments. This was a legacy of Peter. And this is one of the reasons why the, the Patriotic War, the War of 1812, is so important to Russia. Because the Russians go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the finest army ever put together in Europe, and they beat it. And it's not just because of the winter. The Russian armaments are the match of the French armaments, not the cannon. The, the French cannon under Napoleon are very, very good. They're light, they're strong, they're, mo they're more mobile. But the Russian field arms are every bit the match of the French field arms. The reason for that? Because they're basically the same weapons that were being built in the 1760s and the 1770s. Firearms technology is static. It stagnates from about 1750 until the 1830s. What do the Russians have? Smooth bore muzzle loading muskets. The ones that the Russian infantry have in the 1850s were little different than those that had been carried into battle in the late 18th century. And in some cases, they were literally the same weapons. But literally, they were. Because the life expectancy of these things was 40 or 50 years. More often than not, you didn't lose the weapons. You took them with you. You didn't throw them down on the battlefield and run. The service life of a typical musket was between 30 and 40 years. So once you had enough of them in store, you only had to acquire more to replenish those, you know, the few that might have been lost in battle, or if you're going to have a mass mobilization for a big campaign, you have to buy up or have more manufactured. The, army, the Russian army would belatedly convert firing mechanisms from flintlocks to percussion caps beginning in 1842. But all the same, the typical Russian musket was highly inaccurate. It had a range of no more than 200 yards. There are only three battalions of rifled musket formed in 1834. By mid-century, maybe 6,000 troops. Maybe 6,000 troops with rifled muskets. Everybody understand what a rifled musket is? 
That's the one with that internal bore inside. It looks like a spiral. When that when the bullet comes out, it twists a little bit, kind of like a football to be thrown. And this is going to make it more accurate and give it greater penetrating power. But the Russians are still primarily using balls. In the West, new technologies are being adapted. The Russians can't afford to adapt these technologies. Russia has a standing army in the 1850s of 800,000 men. They have to be equipped, supplied, clothed, and fed. If Russian armaments were obsolescent, the training methods were, were absolutely obsolete. Recruits receive very little instruction in how to use their muskets beyond stabbing with the bayonet. And Russians would practice stabbing with the bayonet. They didn't practice shooting much. Why? Ammo is expensive. Ammo is expensive. It's in short supply. We've talked about surplus scarcity in here almost ad nauseum. Get used to it. It keeps coming back. You can't practice with the shot when the shot's in short supply. Commanders had to economize on what would be obviously essential supplies. In the rare instances when marksmanship was practiced and you fired that little lead ball, soldiers were expected to go to the target, pop the lead balls out, and then reuse them. That is how, that's, how, that's how difficult the situation was. Battlefield reality did not figure prominently in regimental training. Preparation fixated almost exclusively on close order drill. What did soldiers do? They marched. They stood at attention. They had good posture. They did parade ground drills. Going back to Peter the Third, Paul the First, even even Nicholas the First. They, the, the Russian emperors loved this parade ground formation. Everything looked nice and orderly. 19th century battlefield looked nice and orderly. We're going to find out. No, it does not. Not in the mid-century. The smallest infractions, the smallest infractions were met with the severest punishments. Discipline was enforced through verbal and physical abuse. Noble and non-commissioned officers routinely cursed, beat, punched, kicked the men under their command. More serious breaches of regulations, like fighting or petty theft, or a first attempt at desertion, could be treated with up to several hundred lashes using a birch rod. In some cases, men uh, would be put in solitary confinement with nothing but bread and water rations for weeks on end. The worst offenders, of course, would be subject to running the gauntlet. An ancient uh, corporal punishment in which a transgressor is forced to run through two rows of comrade soldiers who are standing on either side with sticks. And as the soldier runs through the rows, is beaten as hard as is possible until he's unconscious or somehow makes it to the other end. Now, Russia's engineering and artillery units, they're not too bad. But as for the common ordinary soldier, by the middle of the 19th century, the Russian army was antiquated and inadequate. And yet you have this dichotomy, this image that I showed you guys earlier that prevails in Western Europe of the Russian bear menacing in Eastern Europe, the gendarme of Europe, Nicholas I, poised, ready to invade the West. In reality, by 1850, the Russian army is something of a house of cards. Because what's happened in the West? In the West, you've had a virtual revolution in firearms. <coughs> Rifled muskets are now common. By 1851, you have things known as telescopic sights attached to those rifled muskets. And in some cases, the best cases, the British and the French, they're firing new kind of shots. They're not firing those old round lead balls. They're firing a mini or a mini ball which is, rather than a round shot, it's shaped conoidal. Uh, that's, that's not a very good drawing. It's, it's a conoidal shape with a couple of grooves here. And what this does is when you, when you insert it into the musket, the end of the musket, and you tamp it down with the rod, because it's soft lead, the base of the mini ball flares out, and it scooches up against the sides of the rifled barrel. So that when the trigger is pulled and the charge detonates, 
this spins out like a, like a football, a spiral football, right? And the grooves are going to cut into it, and it's going to impart to it a, greater, a more true trajectory, greater penetrating power, and a great deal more lethality than this round ball sort of tumbling out the end of a smooth barrel. Make sense to everybody? It is this, the mini ball, that is going to produce such terrible death and destruction during the American Civil War. Especially when you add to this something known as the percussion cap, brought about by advances in chemistry and the discovery of fulminates. Fulminates are these chemical compounds that explode or catch fire as a result of force as opposed to a match light. So you pack these tiny little copper caps with gunpowder, you stick them on the end of what is like basically a pin, and when the hammer falls, it drives that percussion cap into the pin, exploding the gunpowder uh, in the breech, sending that mini ball straight forward. A rifled musket firing a mini ball is accurate up to seven or 800 yards. A non-rifle smooth bore musket firing round shot, maybe 200 yards. Add to the rifled musket with the mini ball, a telescopic sight, brand new. And what comes to be known as a sniper uh, can achieve lethality up to 1,100 yards. Who has the advantage? Not the poor bastards with the smooth bore, old-fashioned muskets. Those, alas, would be our Russians. And herein lies Russia's conundrum. Russia has fallen behind again. Just like Russia was behind prior to Peter the Great. Just like Russia was behind <coughs> during the reign of Ivan IV. Russia has found itself, despite all of this great effort, behind yet again. What brings to the entire empire's attention is the outbreak of war in 1853, something known as the Crimean War, which revealed the extent to which Russia's industrial and economic growth had simply failed to keep pace with the more dynamic and productive West. The conflict evolved, it begins as a sort of, a, it evolves from a diplomatic disagreement over the maintenance of Christian sites uh, in, in the Middle East the decline of the Ottoman Empire, Nicholas I's desire to try and grab lands and aggrandize Russia's territory against the Ottomans, and the fear of the British and French that the Russian bear right, was going after the Ottomans and, 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 and perhaps moving into the Middle East and trying to expand <laughs> Russia's sphere of influence. What is paradoxical about the Russian war uh, between 1853 and 1856 is despite the fact that the country has the largest army in Europe, the army is too small to fight this war. It's too small to fight this war. Especially because this war is going to be a modern one. And, and the Russians are fighting against multiple uh, foes on mul multiple fronts. You have, of course, the main frontier in the Black Sea and the Crimean Peninsula around uh, Sevastopol. But the Russians also have to guard against the possibility of Austria entering the war, and so they station a huge contingent of forces along what would be their southwestern border. The Russians are going to fight here as well uh, in, in Transcaucasia. They have to defend against the possibility of attacks from all of these different parts, they're going to end up mobilizing two million men before the war is over, and still it's not enough. The state simply doesn't have the wherewithal and almost bankrupts the state. At the war's outset, Nicholas I stated his belief that the conflict would, and I quote, prove to our foreign enemy, and even Russia itself, that we are still the same Russians of 1812, Borodino and Paris Russians. Unfortunately, that proves to be the case. Russia fights the war as if it's 1812, with 1812 technology and 1812 tactics. The British, the French, and those naughty Sardinians who join with the British and the French, 
they have modern weapons. The Russian defenders in Sevastopol are going to be equipped with smooth bore muskets. They have difficult, difficulty shooting accurately beyond 200 yards. The British and the French have mass produced percussion rifles. They have more than three times the effective range. When the snipers mount those telescopic sights, they can go to 1,200 yards. What is it that the Russian officers emphasize in tactics? They emphasize close order formations, parade marches, and the bayonet. Why? <coughs> because that's how they had trained. Transfer uh, armaments were a, a particular uh, problem. Um, so too was uh, the problem of, uh, of transportation. Transportation. Russia's primitive transportation infrastructure, remember they had only just begun integrating railroads in 1834, and it was too expensive. So Russia doesn't have much of a rail network. It has, only a, it has fewer than 1,000 miles of rail in the entire empire. None of the rail lines head south toward the main theater of operation. They're all north between Petersburg and Moscow. How do, how do recruits get from Moscow and central Russia to the Black Sea? They walk. In most instances, they walk. And that overland journey can take them upwards of six months to a year. Meanwhile, the French and British are embarking from ports on steamboats in London and Marseilles, and they're arriving in theater in about three weeks. It's a serious, serious problem. <coughs> the availability of electric telegraph systems for the French and the British made possible rapid communication between the Allied capitals and their army headquarters in the field. During the course of the war, new relay stations are going to be added so that by the spring of 1855, messages, telegraph messages sent from the British or the French fronts could reach London or Paris in just a matter of hours. In contrast, Russian military dispatches took at least eight days to, week the, to, to, meet, to reach the general staff in St. Petersburg via overland courier. The resulting time lag, of course, wrecked havoc on Russian strategy and logistics. How could you plan and coordinate when it's taking 16 days to have the message sent to the general staff and the response brought back, the British and the French, by the end of the war, communicating almost, almost instantaneously. The information gap was so great that Western newspaper coverage, Western newspapers, which are augmented for the first time by journalistic reports sent over the telegraph, first time a war is reported via the telegraph, Readers of newspapers in London are better informed about what's going on here than the Russian general staff is. That's how far behind the country has fallen. At every turn, Russian units find themselves outgunned, outsupplied, outmaneuvered by better equipped and more technologically advanced adversaries. Now, the French and the British don't have it easy. The Crimean Peninsula is rugged terrain, the harsh climate, the very poor medical conditions are going to lead to devastating losses of life, especially as a result of disease. Most of the approximately 500,000 total troops on all sides lost during the conflict die of disease or complications from wounds. Half a million people. 200,000 Russians are going to lose their lives just in the final siege of the city of Sevastopol. It is the abandonment of Sevastopol following a protracted siege that really marks the beginning of the end of this Crimean campaign. The Tsarist armies are going to win a few uh, battles against the Ottomans and the Caucasus. But with Austria threatening to enter the war, Russia is forced to the bargaining table. In 1856, the Treaty of Paris is signed. France is recognized as the protector of Christians in the Holy Land. Russia is required to surrender territory at the mouth of the Danube, and the, mil and the Black Sea is demilitarized. This shatters any Russian dream of hegemony in the region. The terms were mild, relative to the humiliation that Russia had suffered on the international stage. The idea, the concept of Russia as being the threatening military power, the most powerful nation in Europe, is completely exposed as being a lie. 
it is a traumatic defeat for the autocracy. Nicholas I will die in 1855. He will be succeeded by a new czar, Alexander II. And Alexander II is the one who's going to conclude the Treaty, uh, uh, the, the treaty of Paris that brings peace to the realm. But Alexander II inherits a whole hornet's nest of problems. Russia has been humiliated. The autocracy has been embarrassed. Rising discontent at home brought about by the fact that not only did Russia lose a war, the Tsar's army was incapable of defending Russia's own territory. It's not as if they had gone abroad to Paris or Italy or someplace else and fought and lost. They lost at home, and they lost in a devastating fashion. The Crimean War, the loss of the Crimean War is going to bring about a great deal of soul searching and the recognition on the part of now virtually everyone in Russian society that change has to come. There has to be reform. It's this military debacle that awakens even the Tsar himself, the new Tsar, to the reality that there has to be fundamental economic and social change. And the only way that you can bring about the fundamental economic and social change is by addressing Russia's most backward institution, serfdom. <laughs>